How's it going, everybody? Happy Friday. I know the schedule's a little off this week, and this was on me. I um, I had a show that I recorded with Brett and Roxy, which was a really good show, and I'm really bummed about it. And I was cleaning stuff up from my computer, and I threw stuff in the trash. I was like, oh, that's everything. I don't need it. So I cleared the trash, and I cleared the episode. So it was definitely a, uh, a boomer move uh, on my part. There's no doubting that. Or no denying it, rather. Um, but we did get an episode of Capes and Cows up yesterday with myself and Winston and Chris Carr. So I was like, you know what I'll do today is I'll, I'll do an episode and I'll cover a couple topics, but I'll also get a bunch of questions from you guys. And that's what I did. I posted a community post this morning on the YouTube channel, asked you guys for some questions. You put in some great ones. So we'll go through that. We'll also talk about Fallout. Got renewed for season two already, which is good. Um, we'll discuss that. Netflix is going to stop giving subscriber numbers or something. They're going to stop with the numbers. I thought they just said that they were going to give numbers, and now they're going to stop giving numbers. So, And then there was a trailer for the new M. Night Shyamalan movie, Trap, which I just watched, and we'll discuss that uh, with Josh Hartnett. So that's the gist. And then, like I said, there's a ton of comments, and depending on what... I it's questions. There's a ton of questions, and inside of those questions, um, there might be a topic that I feel we really expand upon here today that winds up being the thumbnail and um, and title. So that's probably why, maybe why you clicked onto it today. I don't know yet. So it's kind of a fly by the seat of our pants, if you will. So if you're new to the show and you've been here before, we do a bunch of shows Monday through Friday. Normally, Friday is our comic book movie show, but I moved it to Thursday, as I mentioned. But we'll be back uh, in form on Monday. We have a lot going on. So, again, subscribe to the channel, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Out We do out of the theater reactions. We have a lot of it happening. So let's get to it. It is the big thing. It's myself and myself. Here we go. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to The Big Thing. It is the Friday episode, and it should be a good one. We have, we have a lot of great questions here today, but um, I'm not going to lie. I'm def definitely very bummed talking to Roxy about this. Is any luck finding it? And I spent like hours just trying to recover this thing. And for people like, well, just go back into the trash bin and, and take the trash bin. And, you know, if, if it's in the trash bin, you take it out of the trash and you restore it. I, I, I'm not new to the computer. <laughs> I had cleared the trash. Why did you do that? Because I was trying to get the whole damn computer clean, and I thought that I had everything that I needed. I already thought I put it in a file, and I didn't. And I was like, damn, damn. I was bummed. We talked about a ton of stuff. Roxy was, it was like, it felt like an old school um, episode of shows we used to do together where we just had a full-on conversation. She was asking me, Questions I was given honest answers. We talked a lot about, about about the move to New York. We talked about stand-up comedy. We talked about a ton of things. And, um, you know, as I mentioned with New York, I just had a Patreon one-on-one -on -one that I do with uh, with one of our one of our loyal listeners. And he was very kind. He said, well, did you guys start the, the New York Amazon list? And I was like, yeah, we did actually. And people have been contributing to it. It's just the wish list because we're starting a new a new studio. Brett and I are going there in May. Um, and then we're going to set up probably by June. This place is already starting to use the, the wide shot. Well, I don't think the camera's on, but if you saw the wide shot yesterday, you noticed the bookshelves are gone. We're starting to kind of dismantle this one. But a lot of the stuff that we had gotten beforehand, some of these lights and other things, some of them will come with us. Some of them will go to the other, um, the other members in the, in the, on the crew to try to better their shots because we've been really working with this other program, uh, that I really, really dig. The other thing that I'm working on, I'm working on a show with uh, with Matt Sarah, trying to do something with Matt Sarah. We don't know exactly what that's going to be yet, but he and I are going to meet and discuss it. I really am looking forward to that. Matt Sarah has become a, a good friend, and I really love his passion. He's hilarious. He is. Uh, he's just he's just a good dude, and he's he knows his shit when it comes to this stuff. So I'm excited to kind of geek out with him once a week. Or maybe more. I don't know yet. We really don't know yet. We're meeting to, to discuss what it's going to be. We just know it's going to be something. So we're excited about that. And it's going to be in studio. So um, that's going to be 
exciting to look forward to going and seeing the the movies and the screenings in the city will be interesting will be fun there will be other things like i saw there are some people that were like well i don't know why you're moving to new york it's just as expensive as la wrong now we're now where i'm going wrong it is very expensive here uh the other thing is uh there's there's more crime in new york i'm not moving to manhattan guys people keep writing that it's like some guy listed all the stuff that was you know, wrong with, with Manhattan. And I'm like, I'm not, and I'm, I'm not living there. I'm not moving there. So um, there's, you know, there's, there's issues anywhere you go. It just depends on why you're going. But nonetheless, it is happening. We're excited about it. Channels are booming right now. This channel is doing very well. I think we're, we're approaching 140,000 subscribers. And then we have the, uh, the other channel. If you're into the UAP phenomenon, Down to Earth with Christian Harloff, we're putting stuff out every day. And, um, well, Monday through Friday, rather. And we're going to, um, we just crossed 20,000 subscribers over there. And we've just been really putting content on that channel since March. So we're, that, that channel's kind of booming right now as well. So we're excited to just start the whole new operation there. Brett's going to help us out, build it out. Brett's going to come out. He'll be on the show in studio in May. He'll be on the show in studio in June. He's going to be visiting New York quite often. Um, so we're pumped about it. But we did get a, a bunch of, questions and things from you guys, and we'll we'll get into that in just a moment. But there are some news stories that I, I also wanted to get to, and here it is. A24, Netflix are now in the spotlight over AI usage. This is from Garth Franklin over at Dark Horizons. Move over Marvel Secret Invasion, open credits, and late night with the devil using brief title cards. It seems both A24 and Netflix have also come under fire for use of potential AI-generated content tied to their films. First up, the marketing campaign for A24 Civil War sparked debate today. When a recent Instagram ad campaign for the film, currently atop the box office, features new images of a number of American landmarks destroyed by the fictional civil war in the film, such such scenes of famous destroyed landmarks aren't in the film itself, and The Hollywood Reporter says on closer expansion, the art has been revealed to be clearly machine-generated with multiple glaring errors. A source for the trade says these images were made just for social channels and said the entire movie is a big what if. And so we wanted to continue that on through social, powerful imagery of iconic landmarks with that dystopian realism. While that can be brushed off as an unfortunate decision making from a marketing department, more serious accusations are being leveled at Netflix in regards to its documentary, What Jennifer Did. Futurism reported earlier this week that Netflix has used what strongly appears to be AI-generated or manipulated images in a recent documentary about a Canadian murder-for-hire plot involving a woman named Jennifer Pan. The photos of her pre-arrest are reportedly never labeled as AI-generated either in the moment or in the credits, but they show clear signs of manipulation. Okay, so I've got opinions on both, and I know that some people are going to agree and disagree at the same time. I don't know. Um, when it comes to the Netflix stuff, that's wrong. Sorry, that's wrong. If you're not saying, if you're not saying, hey, this is manipulated, this isn't a, a real image, that's where it gets real scary. Because when you do more stuff like that, uh, it's like, well, they made this person look this, and and then it, the document, the documentary loses credibility in my eyes. Because well, how much of that is? real what are they just what's fictionalized i saw some thing today that they did with AI about with star wars and making it like the 50s and how like kind of real it looked and when you're doing that kind of stuff for a documentary it 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 hurts the validity of it it does it hurts the validity of it now the thing that people will agree less with me on is or, or yeah they'll definitely agree less with me on is the the civil war thing when it comes to social images and they're posting social images you know, and they're doing it this particular way. It's on them to whether or not. I mean, if if it's not, if it, there's some inaccuracies inaccuracies to it, and it doesn't look great, well, then you just stop putting out quality stuff. But if it's a social post and you're trying, and you still have people who are working in marketing, and you, and you maybe you went over your budget, you have your budget that you have already, and you hired everybody you needed to hire, and you're like, oh, we'll do a couple AI images. I don't see the problem in it. Now, the the answer in that is going to be, well, you're taking away work from from artists that could do it, maybe. Because if they already have their budget and they did their budget already and they, okay, we have the marketing, our marketing team did everything, we don't have any more budget to do it, we can use the images that we already had and we've done those already, but if not, let's just throw some in an AI program that we have and we do it. That's gonna happen more and more often. I took an image, I took an image from uh, Google and I think that I thought it was a, a real image of, I think it was Kong and Godzilla or something. 
Um, and I thought it was a real, like an like international poster. And one of our loyal viewers, who is very, very against AI art, was like, you got to stop using the AI art. This is, I'm like, I, I just, I Googled an image, found what I found. People are very testy about it. I understand it. I understand why people are testy about it. I get it. Um, but that was an image I've had found. And I think that that's one of the things that I'll self-admittedly have to be more important, uh, more um, diligent about and look at because when I do a Google image, I'm like, oh, I just need that to promote it. More and more AI images are going to pop up. And I didn't even, it's something you didn't even think about in the past. Now, some people have a very good eye for it. This particular image that I used didn't, I thought it literally thought it was an international image. And I was like, okay, it, it just, I don't forget what video it was for. You find it on the channel. But as far as the marketing goes on this thing, it depends. You know, if they, if they, if they still had marketing budget left and they could have hired someone to do it, I, I still, I understand that argument if someone else could do it. But I think you're going to see more and more stuff like this as the years go on. Whether you want to say, well, that sucks. That's fair. Or, yeah, it is what it is. But that's what these programs are, are here to stay. And that's going to happen. But the stuff where you're pretending that things... You should, the other thing, though, going back to that Civil War thing, what I will say is this. They should have also... You, you shouldn't be found out. You shouldn't be found out that you're using AI. You should say... Are, uh, you know, uh, images generated by AI. And you can take the hit on it that people are going, what the fuck, why are you using that? But you should you should have to say it because it's it that's I think that's where the honesty of it comes in, especially with this documentary. You can't do that. But I don't know. Very curious where you guys stand on this. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who disagree with me uh, on it. I, I always see how it is. And that's the other, like, the, and, and as I say, you a lot of you have learned this on this channel too we're we're so into the conversation of like i i hope i mean i'm i'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who disagree and i love like i just meant the funny thing is the the guy the guy's name who's a loyal viewer my favorite one of my favorite users name is Darth Vader's burnt asshole that's that's the the name of the guy i love him. i love him because he's a very 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 um supportive viewer it's the only thing he really ever comes after us about is that stuff but he never does it in a way that's insulting. He always does it in a way like this is puts his thoughts in there, has a very strong opinion about it, and it's respected. Never, never once saying, never delete his comments, never saying too, because it's it's a conversation. He's got a point of view. I want to hear it. I love hearing the point of views. I love even even when they're not on the same page. For example, we did something yesterday. We we talked about the uh, Transformers One trailer, and there are people who are like, guys, I don't agree with you. I think this this. This to me, this trailer is for kids. I enjoyed it, so I'm 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 liking the other stands for it. So I disagree. I think you guys are on the wrong wrong page here. Stays up, part of the conversation. Great great comment. Stupid comment I got yesterday was, "Well, congratulations, Orloff. You're now part of the heart of the hate channels. You're now part of the hate channels. And why don't you go on uh, this channel and that channel? You now you, you've you've gone to the far side." And I'm like, "No, because if you watch the video." I clearly say, I hope that I am wrong about this movie. I, I hope that I go and I laugh and I go, wow, I was wrong. This trailer was actually really funny. It was heartwarming and it worked and the trailer didn't do us justice. That's not a hate channel, Jack. That's just someone going, this trailer stinks. And if you don't agree with it, you go into the comment section and you say what that well thought out, intelligent comment did which was, I completely disagree with you. I think this trailer looked wonderful. It looked fun. It looked like it was something for my kids because I can relate to that. And I can relate to the fact that that trailer will probably work for my six-year-old. Just didn't work for me at all. And I thought that for the particular tone that they were going with Transformers 1, I didn't think it worked. Um, so there are ways to have conversations. So when you're doing it with the AI conversation, same thing. I know a lot of you are going to disagree with me on the Civil War aspect of it. So let's hear why. Because I always like to hear thoughts of like, oh, you know what? I never really thought of that. I never really thought of that point of view. And that actually makes a lot of sense because you, you don't, people, you don't, there are some people who believe they know everything, but we don't. So put your comments in there and let me know.
Um, we have more topics to talk about. We have a lot of things to talk about. And as I am telling you, as we're building out, and, and the reason that we've been able to keep the show going as long as we have is because of the support you guys have been giving us and also because of our wonderful sponsors and AG1, obviously one of them. Love AG1, love Rocket Money. Quick thoughts on both of them right now. All right, guys, let's talk about AG1. You guys know I love AG1. If you've been listening to my show, you've heard me talk about them, and I've been drinking them for about two years now, and I love it. Never been a vitamins guy. I've told you that. I take it all one shot, AG1. I put it in a water bottle. I shake it up. I'm good to go. I recommend AG1 to my friends. I recommend AG1 to my family, everybody. AG1 is a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and maintains high quality standards. You guys know they've been with us for a while because you guys know too. You've all been checking them out and everybody who's been signing up to AG1 says the same thing. It's changed your energy. It's changed how you approach things in a day. You're smiling more running around the place and you're sleeping better. I know. AG1 is the supplement that I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. And that's why they've been a partner for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and you get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash big thing. Drinkag1.com slash big thing. Check it out. Rocket Money, I've been telling you guys about Rocket Money forever because there's a lot of times that you forget about these subscriptions and you either pay twice for it, you didn't realize it, you sign up for a thing and you're like, oh, I'll do that first free month and then it's gone. You, you, your money's gone every month. Did Rocket Money do what you wanted them to do for you when you signed up? Because it did it for me. I had all these subscriptions and I was like, oh, and it lists it out and it says, don't do that. You don't need these. It tells you how much money you have uh, that you've spent in the month. It tells you, it, it gives you your credit score. It gives everything. I mean, Rocket Money for me is the way to go. It's a personal finance app. Um, yeah, right. And yeah, and it finds and it cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and it helps lower your bills, which is the best. So you can grow your savings because Rocket Money has, has over 5 million users and it's saved a total of 500 million, wow. saving members up to $740 a year. So don't waste money. Cancel your unwanted subscription and go on over to rocketmoney.com slash big thing. Rocketmoney.com slash big thing. All right. Thank you to AG1. Thank you to Rocket Money. So happy that I've gotten, I mean, just yesterday, somebody said, hey, I signed up to AG1. Uh, I think I'm going to love it from everything you say about it. I was like, you will. You will love it. And Rocket Money, another one. It keeps your finances going. It keeps you locked into your finances. Absolutely love Rocket Money. Okay, next one. Let's talk about this. All right, new trailer for M. Night Shyamalan's Trap just released yesterday. I didn't do a trailer reaction to it, but I watched it this morning before I got on the air because I wanted to talk about it. It premiered in the official trailer for M. Night Shyamalan's latest thriller, Trap, which opens on August 9th. The psychological thriller was shot last year in Canada and follows a man and his daughter attending a pop concert. They soon realize the whole event is a trap being laid by the cops to catch the serial killer, The Butcher. Josh Hartnett stars as the father. Haley Mills plays Dr. Grant. And Shyamalan's R&B singer-songwriter daughter, Salika, plays the concert's lead act, Lady Raven. Um, okay, so I watched this trailer today. And as I was watching, I, I, I actually regretted not doing a trailer reaction to it because I was like, oh, wow, I would have liked to have seen myself get caught there because talking about know-it-alls, I'm watching this particular moment. And if you haven't seen the trailer, it's going to be a spoiler. So I would recommend watching the trailer. And the trailer comes on and and he's, and he's Josh Hartner walks up to the uh, one of the people at the stadium who looked like RB3, by the way. And... Um, He's asking him, like, what's going on? What's going on here with the, why are there cops outside? He takes his daughter to this concert. He goes to the bathroom for a second. He goes and talk, talks to the guy at, working at the stadium. And the guy tells him, well, they're setting up in the butcher. They're, they're looking for the serial killer, the butcher. And right when he said that, I went, oh, come on. Don't tell me that, that he's, the big twist is that this guy's going to be the serial killer. I see that coming a mile away. The twist is that this guy, the whole time, we think that he's trying to get his daughter out of the, the trap and... Then we find out at the end he's the killer, and then within seconds, like, no stupid, he is the killer. It's the whole point of the movie is that it's called Trap, and he's the killer trying to get out of the trap. Like, 
Oh. So the only other twist, I hope it's not, is that it's in his head the whole time and he's not actually the killer, which is also possible. But I don't, and, and I remember Brett talking about this on the show. We were talking about uh, Shyamalan because I think we were, I don't know why it came up. Oh, I so said I had watched Unbreakable recently. And I, and Brett had said this the problem with M. Night movies now is you're always waiting for like the big twist, and that's too much pressure on him. If it's a good ending, it's a good ending. I don't need there to be a twist. I'm sure that he always feels like he needs to have a twist, but I don't need a twist. I don't need a big twist at the end. Just make show me. Just show me what happens. I'm sure this one seems kind of seems set up to have a twist, but I don't need it. I don't know if you guys feel the same, but the trailer looked really good. I liked the trailer. I didn't know what to expect from the trailer, and I'm on. I I just I'm a Josh Hartnett fan now. The Oppenheimer movie really won me over from him. I've always thought he was. I he went from thinking like everybody else, oh, he's just a good looking guy. He's fine. Pearl Harbor cares. To wait a minute, this guy might have some chops. And I first saw that actually in like Black Hawk Down, but you really saw his chops. I think he was because of Killian Murphy and uh, Robert Downey Jr., his performance was kind of overshadowed because his performance was great and he could have easily been nominated in that movie. And I like the idea of seeing him in this role where he's a, he's, well, he's either a lunatic serial killer or he thinks he's one. And he's just envisioning it in his head. Whatever it is, he is um, he, he's got that good lunatic smile that you see at the very end, and or the, a lot of different times throughout the trailer. And what he's what he's doing, he's a he's a real nutball in this. So we're going to see that. And I and I like him. I think he's I think he's a good actor. So um, and I like I like these types of movies. These movies are doing. There's kind of a resurgence on the. Yeah, it's a it's a stadium, so it's a big location, but it's not like it's it's one. It really is one location. It's a stadium, albeit a, a big location. I like that we're going back to this type of stuff. I just saw Abigail, and Abigail takes place in a big house, and that's it. Just I mean, the beginning of the movie is outside for a little bit, but for the most part, it takes place in a big house. Love that, love that. It's gonna cut down on some costs and just make a good movie. Give me some character, keep me on the edge of my seat. And that's it. So what would you guys think about that? Dig it? Tell me. Streaming giant Netflix says it will no longer report subscriber numbers starting with the first quarter of next year. The announcement was made as part of its first quarter 2024 earnings report today, with the streamer beating expectations and gaining a further 9.33 million subscribers, 2.5 of which were from North America, to hit 270 million globally. In addition, it beat expectations on earnings. However, investors likely weren't happy hearing the news about the stopping of subscriber number reports as shares dropped nearly 5%. Numbers of subscribers has been a key metric for all streaming services for years, and Netflix says it will still announce major subscriber milestones as we cross them, but will no longer disclose them on a quarterly basis. In addition, it will no longer report on average revenue per member. Instead, engagement, namely the amount of time you spend on the service, is being seen as the best proxy for customer satisfaction. Despite some strong subscriber gains in various markets recently, these numbers are expected to plateau and the new metrics are being seen as where the streamer has more potential to grow in the future. Additionally, other revenue generation methods for them from their password crackdown, paid sharing initiative, and advertising revenue aren't tied to subscriber count. Um, this to me, it's like, you can make a big stink about it. And I understand if you have, especially if you're, if you have stock in them and all that stuff, I, I, I get it. I don't. Um, so, I, it's just one of these things. I'm like, yeah, I, I said this about Netflix a long time ago. Netflix can do pretty much whatever they want. People are not going to cancel them. It's not going to happen. So they're like, we don't want to tell people how many subscribers we have anymore because if we feel like it's going to plateau for a little bit, we'd rather say when it's time, hey, look, we just hit this big number. Look at that. How long did it take you to get there? Don't worry about it. Um, and it's not going to hurt them. 5%, okay, but they're still going to gain it back. It's not. Whether I'm not saying I agree with it or disagree with it, I actually tend to lean more on the disagree with it, but it doesn't bother me as much because I at one point was going to cancel Netflix and I can't remember what it was because I just wasn't. There was a show that I was watching for a bit, it wasn't on anymore. I'm like, I don't need to watch this. My family did not like that decision. They all have stuff they watch on it they, from, from the six year old to my wife. They were like, no. 
we are keeping Netflix. Cancel one of the other ones, not canceling Netflix. And I feel like a lot of people feel that way. I think there's there's too much on Netflix that they know they've got the power. So they don't want to tell you numbers. They're not going to. Again, more so on the wrong than the right. But I'm just saying they can do it. it stinks is what it is. So, again, what do you think about that? Agree? Disagree? What say you? All right, last one before I get to your questions. Um, Fallout. Very, very popular show right now. That, by the way, was the main topic of yesterday's show that we lost. Um, It was essentially Fallout or Shogun. What's the show of the year thus far? Roxy went with Shogun but said that this is the number two. And now it's official that Amazon Prime Video has renewed its science fiction action its official Action Prime video has renewed its science fiction action comedy Fallout for a second season, the order coming in one week after the first season launch in full last week. The series, based on the famed video game, has debuted to some of the best reviews to date for a Prime video release, with 94% from the, from the critics. While they haven't released any official numbers on how it performed, they say it is among the top three titles to date. Amazon MGM Studios' Jennifer Salk had this to say. Jonah, Lisa, Geneva, and Graham have captivated the world with this groundbreaking wild ride of a show. The bar was high for lovers of this iconic video game, and so far we seem to have exceeded their expectations while bringing in millions of new fans to the franchise. We are thrilled to announce Season 2 after only one week out and take viewers even farther into the surreal world of Fallout. A second season order comes as little surprise as the series had already scored a $25 million tax credit to film a second season in California, a shift from the first season, which was largely shot in New York and Utah. According to that filing, the new season will have a budget of $152 million. This is a no-dust story. Of course. This is a, this is a very popular show that is crushing for Amazon that, you know, the biggest criticism that it had was that dumping it all at once. Imagine, imagine, I know you got all your numbers like right away and you got some big numbers there on, on, on the series because people were binging it and all that. But imagine you did this show week to week and the kind of conversation that would have come out of that. I still think it was a major mistake. And I wonder if they'll change that up because there was a lot of criticisms to that, that a lot of people felt that way. Um, but, doesn't take away from the fact that this was a major success. I mean, that could be the argument against it. Like, well, no, look at the numbers that we did on this thing. And we were so confident and so happy with the numbers that we got. We greenlit a season two and $152 million. And that's the thing, man. And you look at that show and, you know, longer episodes. And then you got, you got Acolyte coming out too. Now those are shorter episodes. And that show cost reportedly around 200 million. So fingers crossed that it's a good one. As well. So we'll see. June is going to be pretty interesting. You got that. You got um, The Boys season, was it four? You got House of the Dragon and The Bear. I mean, June's going to be stacked. Stacked. Anyway. So what's your thoughts on Fallout? Do you Are you excited that season two already got greenlit? Did you just kind of see it coming like everybody else? Put your comments in there. Let's hear it. All right, here's the good thing. You guys have some questions. You had a lot of questions, and I pulled some questions. So let's answer the questions, and we'll start with this one. Jimmy Davis, 763. What's your whole thought on the WWE now that they're going to move forward and push Cody for many months to stay champion, or are they going to move in and have The Rock take it? Um, They should not have The Rock take it. They should not have The Rock take it. They should stick with Cody. And I, we, well, you knew this was going to happen, by the way. And this sticks to my everyone. I, every time I say this, someone goes, "What are you talking about?" When it comes to um, like popular things, and Avatar was popular for a very long time. Um, then after a while, people hated it. Um, I said this recently. Joker was one of the most popular movies. People started to hate it. I never heard anyone hate it. I've heard a lot of people hate on Joker. Um, there's been a lot of mo- movies, TV shows, things that have happened that people love. It's popular, and then they hate it. Same thing's going to happen with Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes, everybody losing their minds out of Cody Rhodes. After three promos, people are tweeting out, it's the same promo over and over again. He can't hold his champion. The guy's been champion for a week. Give him a break. Hasn't had a match. It's like, so let it build. Let it build. Um, but you don't give it to The Rock. You, you let Cody Rhodes beat The Rock at SummerSlam to put Cody over even more to get him more popular. And you play out this role, you bring Heel Rock back, 
The Rock doesn't need the championship. 52 years old, it, it, the, the power that he's added, the, the championship elevates talent. You know, you, the Rock's already elevated. You don't need the championship. And and to what? To have Cody lose it after four or five months of having the title? And and I'm not saying this to you like your your idea is ludicrous because it's been floated around a lot. I've seen it floated around a lot that will The Rock come back, beat him, and then Cody's got to beat him and become a two-time champion. I, I I think that wouldn't be the move. I think you got to keep... Cody up there because he's becoming more mainstream and you got to build stars. You got to build more mainstream stars in order to keep the company relevant because Roman Reigns did what he could and now he's, he's deserves the break. The rock is the rock. Um, but you need more big superstars right now. And Cody, you got to build with Cody. So, uh, I think this is the right play of what they're doing. Sticking with wrestling. Callie Lewis, what's your opinion on AEW showing that CM Punk footage? So we talked about this, Roka and I, I think on Monday's show, complete Piker move. Um, I, I see even even hardcore AEW fans, and I'll, I'll say this, I'm not an AEW hater at all. I was actually very much on board and, and rooting for them when they launched because I think that at the time where WWE was, they needed you needed an alternative because it was so stale. There would be the same stuff and the way that it was being run, the creative was awful back then. Um, so, and I was, I was under the assumption, I just thought AEW was going to be something different where it was going to go back to the kind of old sports thing. The titles were going to mean, mean more. I don't have a criticism on, on the AEW product because truthfully, I just don't watch it enough. So I don't have a criticism on it where people are like, oh, you just, you're an AEW hater. No one's ever said to me, I'm just saying, if you're about to say that, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't. I actually love the idea that they give more people opportunity and give people a chance. I think they were the first ones to let, well, not the first ones, but they were the ones to let wrestlers be free on the microphone again and do and do their thing and not just worry about the scripts. And then WWE now is starting to do that as well. Thank God again. Um, so there's a lot of benefits and there's a lot of things. Um, and I've had friends that have worked for AEW and I have people that, there that have Friends that are wrestled there, friends that are uh, that are um, that were commentators, and they give a lot of people opportunities. This was a very amateur move of what Tony Khan did because by showing that footage, and so for those of you guys who don't know, basically what happened was that there was a CM Punk was a, a very popular wrestler. You've seen him on this show. Um, he was with the company, and then he left. There was a altercation in the back. He talked about it recently on Ariel Hawani's show. He went into detail of it. And because of that, the response was, well, we're going to show the actual footage, and it's going to make Punk look bad at their pay-per-view event. It didn't make him look bad. First of all, there was no sound. There was no sound, so you didn't know. So what it looked like, it looked like the stuff that Punk was saying was true and that he they had an altercation in the back. And But Tony Khan, who owns AEW, at one point said he feared for his life during that altercation. I don't see what that, where that came from. Maybe there's stuff afterwards that they didn't show, but nothing from that footage showed that. Um, and it just, it just looked petty. And what I think could have played better if it was almost like a, a ruse, where they're like we're going to show some footage, some crazy footage, and it wasn't, and it was like a skit or something. You people are pissed, pissed off, but. At least you wouldn't have done that. They didn't do anything. And nobody turned again. It didn't turn anyone against Punk. What, it got you like, got you like an extra 800,000 viewers or something? Something like that? Maybe? If that? So, yeah, it was, uh, it was not good. It didn't work. I mean, people are not talking about it as much now. You forget. But it's just, it taints, it taints the, the legacy of it. I did think that, I don't know enough about Will Ospreay, except that people love him as far as um, his in-ring stuff and and I think he's going to be a major star. I think it was a mistake to make comments about Triple H and his wife in a promo. I think that was a mistake. Um, we'll find out if it hurts his career in the long run, but it might have been a mistake. But that's it. All right, next one. We have continued into the wrestling corner, everybody. David Campbell. What's up, David? Long time no talk. If you were going to show a non-wrestling fan a match from WrestleMania 40 to encourage them to watch, what would it be? I mean, it... Uh, It'd probably have to be the main event. If you're asking me a non-wrestling fan, it would have to be the main event uh, night two. Because the non-wrestling fan will know The Rock, right? I mean, unless you then want to show them the main event of night one. That's I retract my statement. I retract my statement. 
I would probably show the non-wrestling fan night one because the main event of night one with The Rock because of that example that The Rock is The Rock. The story is there. They'd have to watch that promo of everything happening because if watching that main event is successful on that non-wrestling fan, they're automatically going to want to watch the main event for night two. And I think that's exactly what happened. So that's my answer. My answer is I would show them night one main event and then hope that they would want to watch the main event in number two. I think that would, and I think that's essentially what happened with a lot. That's why the ratings went up so much because the non-wrestling fan or the fan that had been out of it for so long was kind of brought in back by the rock. The story got them and then they watched the main event of night two because of it. That's my, that's my opinion on it. All right, going out of wrestling here for a second, and this is from uh, Greg Howell, 9767. You might have addressed this already, but I missed it. Why the move back to New York? I'm assuming family-related, and if it's none of our business, I get it. Also, what new things are possibly being in New York? No, it's a great question. So, yes, family has a lot to do with it, for sure. Um, kids and uh, being around family and being around friends and just a, a, a change uh, in, in everything is one of the major factors, and the question was, as my wife and I were talking about, is can I do what I do from New York? It's like, yeah, there's really only, I don't want to say there's only two places, but there are two places where I can do this and really thrive and be happy, I think, and that's um, L.A. and New York. L.A. to me is just not the same anymore. Um, it is, it's changed. A lot of people still love it, and I'm happy, but to me it kind of stinks now, um, and, there's, and it's expensive. So, as you're writing your comment, well, New York's not any less expensive. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm not moving to Manhattan. Um, L.A., the way it works is that there's, it's so it's so big that we're essentially, even though downtown L.A. has, like, its city, the whole portion of L.A. is essentially kind of like Manhattan. And the prices are skyrocketing. You want to buy a house for your family? I mean, see you later. No chance. Um, but in areas in New York and suburbs and stuff of that nature— Affordable. Just to give you an example, gas here, gas down the street from my place, $5.67 for gas. Where I'm moving, gas right now is $3.15. So for those who say, that's how you can always tell on price differences. It went into the, when I was there looking at the place in, in March, I went into the grocery store. Groceries are, are less. Things are less. So cost of living, family, but also I can do what I'm doing. I'm renting a studio there and I'll be, I'll have my, I'll have a studio and I'm going to have more room than I have here. We're going to set, make sure that we set up everybody good. That I mentioned it earlier that we're going to have, um, that Matt, Sarah and I are going to do something. I have some other friends that are going to be doing something. I want to introduce you guys to new people also keeping the old people, um, in the shows the same way that we're doing. But I think that we can change it up and pr it's, it's, like, it is the New York area, guys. It's not like the middle of nowhere where there's not people who can talk about these things. And you always like them. Pe people, I was on with a patron yesterday, and he was saying, like, look, I'll be honest. I just don't like change. Um, and I said, that's most people. But once you get used to the changes, that's the whole point of it, right? And I remember when we brought Brett in back in the day. Who's this guy? Why is this guy here? We don't need another guy. And people love Brett. I mean, that was every single person we brought in. When it was just Mark and I, and then we brought people in. Like, Who's this person? Who's this girl? Why is they, why are they here? Um, and I understand that. Uh, and it's it's just it is a new it's just a new opportunity, new life. I want to be around family. I want to be closer to my family. I've been away from my family for a very long time. Um, my wife has been here her whole life, so it's just time for a change. And um, and I also, to be completely honest with you, as I was going through everything that I have. I have a good friend now who I can call, I can call a good friend now, in Josh Horowitz, who I just went to watch his show. Um, I didn't even mention this yet, and I should. He invited me to the Tom Hiddleston conversation that he had at um, here in L.A.'s live show. It was so great. It was so great. And he's so good. Josh is so good at what he does. And he, and he interviews so many different, I mean, he interviews everyone. But him and Tom Hiddleston, they're like close now, right? So Tom like, made sure he did his first show with him, and it was a, and it was a really good show. Fun show, but like I'll be doing stuff with Josh, and I'll go out and I'll 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 go out into the city and I'll go see Josh, and if I need like certain like for screenings or publicists or things of that nature, it's not like 
there's, there's not a lot that's going to be changing except the fact that some of the people that you love are not going to be in the studio. They're going to still be on the show. They're just not going to be in the studio. There will be other people in the studio. They're still doing studio shows. And I'm not using the only thing I use StreamYard for is um, the Monday show. And I'm going to start to phase out of that because m for me, I'm not a big um, I, I'm not a big fan of the the two kind of boxes and another box on top and where the sound kind of distorts and the quality of the camera goes out. I, I just I'm I'm just not a fan of of that. I don't mind it on the Monday shows, but I'm going to start to, because it's just a side shot of John and I, but I think I'm going to even start to change that up, as I mentioned. But I just don't like the way it looks. I just think it it, it, it reminds me of the pandemic days, and I don't like it. And I wouldn't blame you if you were like, eh, I don't like the way that it is either. But I've been using this stuff on on this new program that has for the UAP show that I do with Attack Peter, who has a wonderful setup, wonderful setup. It, it's, it looks so good. And you wouldn't even you couldn't even tell the sound this the sound and the ca camera quality we don't talk over each other because with OBS, it's the the program that I use. It's like I just use a switcher, go back and forth, and that's it. And it's just like, almost like he's sitting in the room with me. But like you're limited on on Streamyard, so I'm gonna do the and as that's the whole reason we're going back in May to re really work on a quality studio. And make it look. That's why I may put together that wish list. Whether people get stuff or not, I got to get stuff on that wish list because I'm going to, for my that I'm going to get that I'm going to purchase myself because I'm going to. Um, I want to make a. I want to make it as an experience for you guys that when you turn and turn on the show, you're like, oh man, yeah, okay, I see. I see what he's. I see what he's doing. And there are majority of you who have you know come on board. And we haven't just, I saw some silly, silly comment that they was like, well, you know, Christian hates all the shows that he's on, that he's ever been on. So is he going to hate the big thing next? I've hated Collider Live and I, and I, and I'm just not a fan of, of Jedi Council of doing those shows. Love Schmoes, no, love Schmodown, love uh, a, a lot, a lot of the shows that I've done and been a part of, but evolution is evolution and you got to be able to pivot. And I love the big thing is nothing's really changing with the big thing um, because I it's my favorite show that I've ever done. And I said this two years ago. I said it three years ago. I say it now. It's my favorite show that I've ever done. It's the most me I've ever felt. It's the most fun. Like, and this is what we talked about a lot on that show that was lost was that the reason I love that show with Roxy and Brett so much is that the Monday show serves with Roka and I live show talking about topics. We take your live questions. You guys throw super chats in there. It's a live show. It serves exactly what it's supposed to do, and it is uh, it is for topics. It's for two people talking about movies and wrestling and all that stuff, and it and it stays the same. And that's what you know what you're getting when you go there. The Tuesday show is our U UFO UAP show that we do that does the news topics from the UFO stuff and all that that we talk about with whether it's me and Riley and Pavel and Attack Peter. That's our that's our crew, and you know you're getting that every Tuesday, Wednesday. You get my either myself, Steph, and Mike usually, but now Chris Carr has been coming on, you know, so it'll be either myself, Mike, and Steph, or myself, Mike, and Chris Carr, or myself, Steph, and Chris Carr, and then we talk about the same thing. It's kind of like the big thing topics, the main news topics, and we goof around. We have some fun. Thursday is. Probably, even though I know view-wise, it it's the weakest of the five. It is so relaxing and refreshing for me to do because it can be a full conversation about a date that Roxy went on and Brett and I ripping jokes the whole time. And a lot of you who watch the show love that dynamic and love that side of it. So, And then obviously the, the Friday show is the Capes and Cowl show with Winston and Coy, which a lot of you says... A lot of you think it's your favorite favorite one out of the five. I mean, I know that it, it varies for, for a lot of you. But um, that's why I have so much fun doing it because I don't feel like I'm handcuffed to do anything. That's why that's why I didn't love doing some of the other shows I did in the past is because I felt handcuffed. I felt handcuffed to where it was like, okay, and I say this all the time, I really liked uh, the people that I worked with over at Collider, and I will remember this. They had some of the hardest-working um, behind-the-scenes tech people 
that you're ever going to meet. And they would have people do graphics for the show, for like say Jedi Council. And they had them work on it. And I would go into this one topic and I'm like, let's just stay on this topic for a bit because it's a good conversation. I just want to stay in the conversation. We'd stay in it like 35, 40 minutes and then I get talked to afterwards. You got to switch topics because they made all these graphics for the other ones and it's like a waste of time, which I get for, for the person who's making the graphics. I get it. But I was like, yeah, but it takes away from the show. It takes away from that, that organic conversation. And to be fair, the show was structured to be a news like the, the, this show this show is structured to have epis like you know uh news stories but if i don't get to one of them i don't get to one of them because i felt another topic was more intriguing or i wind up spending I, you know a lot of times sometimes we'll, go, right, we'll spend five minutes five ten minutes on it then move after you hit 10 minutes uh, if, if if it's 20 minutes like we talked about that when we did x-men 97 last week on capes and cows with myself um winston and chris carr like we spent like 25 to 30 minutes on that episode. And I'm like, eh, well, if we go longer, we go longer. And I love that. And so Thursday to me is one of those episodes where I just, I love, I mean, I, 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 Brett to me comedically is the, the person I really enjoy being on camera with the most. Um, and it just, he, even when the cameras are off, we just make each other laugh. I've known the guy for out of everybody the longest. So, he ain't going anywhere. Roxy and I are really good on the mic we, together. We've been doing this forever. And, you know, she's worried about the fact that I'm going to find new people and all that. And and I will find new people. There's no doubt about that. But it doesn't mean that the that the other people are going to go away. That's my point about bringing them in. Um, anyway, let me just do this real quick because I want to finish up all the rest of the questions. And I've told you guys and, and uh, many times over the reason why I'm so grateful is that you continue to support the show. You continue to listen when I say, hey, you, you get yourself something good when you and you're helping out the show. Let me tell you about a few more of our sponsors right now. I'll tell you a little bit more about cuts. OK, so it, and I've always told you guys that, you know, when you go and you check these things out, they're all things that I love. And I've talked about it many times over that I only have things on the show that I dig. So for you guys, most guys, I think, wear a T-shirt every day of their lives if they could. I mean, I know I would. The problem is that most shirts are not acceptable to wear. You can't wear them at work. You can't wear, wear them out like on a date. Well, but today's sponsors, Cuts, they've changed it. Cuts T-shirts are high quality, wrinkle free, and so buttery soft that you can look like you're dressing up even when you're dressing down. Yeah, wrinkle free. And it's true. I've had these things. I love these things. I'm I'm on the move. So when I'm I'm like, oh no, my shirt's gonna be wrinkled. Nope. In a limited time, you can save money. You can refine the dress code, but you gotta head on over to cutsclothing.com and use that code big thing for 20% off. So go to cutsclothing.com and use that code big thing. It's so good. They like they've changed the t-shirt game. It's tons of simple and they're sophisticated items. The bottom stretch, they fit joggers. They, they, they look way better than the khakis and they're 1,000 times more comfortable. So for a limited time, again, our listeners will get 20% off of your entire order. We got to use that code big thing at checkout. 20% off your order at cutsclothing.com. Big thing. Support our show and tell them that we sent you. Experience the perfect blend of style and comfort with Cuts Clothing. All right, you know what stinks? When you're stuck in a loop of rent payments, you're just watching your money vanish into thin air. It's the worst. It's time to turn the rent game around and start earning some serious rewards. How do you do that? That is where Built Rewards comes in. Built is breaking ground as the first rewards program that hooks you up with points on your rent. Doesn't matter, even if you're rocking the old school rent check vibes, Built Rewards, it's got your back. They're gonna mail the check for you. It's like basically having a personal rent paying assistant. It's the best. Every month you pay your rent and you watch the points roll in. Use points to jet off on a dream vacation, put your points towards a flight or a hotel stay with 500 plus airlines and 700,000 plus hotels and properties. Pay rent hassle-free through the Built Rewards app. Your rent game just got a major upgrade. Earn points by paying rent right now when you go to joinbuilt.com slash big thing. That is join B-I-L-T.com slash big thing. Let's talk about some habits because you guys know you got some habits and there's nothing better than beating a bad habit with a good habit. And we've talked about 
fume before you guys you guys know we've talked about fume uh, we've we've had fume on and we're glad that they are back it's great and mark riley is the one who's really been talking this thing up and i can't wait for him to to talk about it even more so on the show um when he's on for uap and he just talked about how flavorful it was better than he thought it feels very fresh and it's like a refreshing herbal tea but if it was vapor uh it, it was it, you can look at it like sticky soda it's got non it's 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 really good it's it's well weighted it's perfectly balanced it's extremely fun to fidget with and it really look at the, the the wood itself it's it's great you can start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com slash big thing and getting the journey pack today fume is giving listeners to the show 10 percent off when they use that code big thing to help make starting the good habit much easier because it's you get it. Instead of bad, fume is good. It's a habit that you're free to enjoy and it makes replacing your bad habit easy. It comes with adjustable airflow dial and it's designed with movable parts. It's great. They use flavored air instead of vapor. The fume is completely, completely natural, by the way, instead of electronics. And there's no, this is the reason why I decided people are like, well, why, why would you, why would you get involved with something like this? Why? Because they don't use harmful chemicals. They use delicious flavors. And that's why I got involved. Fume works. They're great. So thank you again to Fume for sponsoring the show. All right. Thank you to Built Cuts Clothing and, of course, Fume. As I mentioned many times over that if you want to help the show out and you can, you have the means to get something nice for yourself. Go to one of our sponsors. I always link it in the description. I always put it as the top comment. So thank you. Thank you kindly. All right. Let's keep going. Back to wrestling. Isaiah Kennard, 9943. If The Rock has four more matches in him. What PPV and who does he wrestle? I don't know PLE. I'm probably going to figure out what PLE is later, but let's just say um, who does he wrestle? Well, I think you got to do you got to do Cody Rhodes obviously in SummerSlam. You got to do one with Roman Reigns now. You probably got to do another team match, but this time you'd assume that Roman Reigns is going to come back as a baby face and maybe Rock teams up against him and whatever it might be, but. If if Stone Cold still had it left in him, I'd say Stone Cold. But I just I think Stone Cold's just moving slow right now, and I think I I honestly think yes, money had something to do with the reason why he didn't show up at WrestleMania. But I also think that he just knows he he just he, you know he's he's older. He just doesn't have it anymore, and he he was moving slow at the last WrestleMania. He says he's got one more left in him, but not at the capacity and the speed that the Rock the Rock still got it. Rock didn't look like he missed a step. You know he moved a little slower, but but. You know, it, it, I think there's more wear and tear to, to Stone Cold's body um, than The Rock, also. But I think those three, and maybe maybe L.A. Knight would be interesting, also. Maybe L.A. Knight, but yeah, that's it. Joshua Gonzalez, if you watched the first episode of Shogun, please tell us your thoughts, and if you'll continue watching, did your wife like it too? So we started watching it last night, and I was like, okay, let's do this. We started watching, and she was into it, and I was into it too, and then w she was like. I'm exhausted. A very long day today. I want to finish this. And I was like, okay, well, should I finish it? She's like, no, wait for me. So that was a good sign. But it means I had to freaking turn it off last night. I was like, I want to finish. What's going on? I'm really digging it. And I was really digging the episode. We got it about 40 minutes into the first episode and had to shut it off. So I um, I will continue to watch it. I did like it. I want to see. So basically what I'm going to do is see if my wife digs episode one, wants to continue on. If she doesn't, then I'll start doing what I said I was going to do, which is watch alongs, you know, with the footage and stuff in it, the way that I do like reactions to the episodes. Um, if not, if she does watch the whole series, I'm going to watch the series with her and then I'll do a full review of the series once it's over. So there you go. Jacob Blackar, with the move to New York, are there any possible collabs with the basement yard, boys? Just wondering, since you had Frank in the Schmodown for a bit, keep up the great work. I would love to. I speak to Frank quite often on text. I've never met. Um, Joe before, but I speak to Frank quite often on uh, text. He's been super supportive of the move. That's another example, by the way, of someone that I that I um, talk to when it comes to the move. And Frank's a family man like myself, and they're doing some great things right now. They've been touring all over the place, and they've been doing um, they've been really really working hard. They just did some with my buddy Andrew Santino recently. So I love Frank Alvarez. I think he's a really good dude. Had an opportunity to get to know him a little bit during the Schmodown, as you mentioned.
but been talking to him more. I would love to do something with those guys, and I think that I probably will absolutely meet up with Frank when I get back. You now, whether or not we wind up doing a show together, or I mean, not a full on show, but I mean, if we do like a collabs or something, um, fingers crossed. I would love to. So. Hit Frank up and tell him you want to you want to see me do something. I don't think you really need to do that. I think he already mentioned it to me. But um, but yes, I would absolutely love to. I love those guys. Night for your TV seven seven five most three anticipated movies for the rest of the year. Well, if I go back to my list and let me see there because there's a lot it's a lot up there. Um, and there was something that shoot there was something that just came out of trailer the other day. I said that, that just popped up on my list and I said if it wasn't already a little Joker obviously. Joker too is 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 really up there, really up there. Deadpool, really up there, and then um, I mean, Apes. Yeah, those are the three that pop. The, the, I'm going with the first three that popped into my head, and probably there's some probably other ones that I'm looking forward to. But those are the first three that pop into my head, so I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go Joker, Deadpool, and uh, and Apes. Those are the three. Only morale. In 2021 or 2022, I remember there was a term stating that movie theaters are back, but with a certain number of blockbuster movies not hitting a billion dollars last year, like Mission Impossible 7, Fast 11, Indiana Jones, and no movies yet this year to hit a billion. Are the numbers down in going to the movie theaters this year, Christian, and why? And which movie do you think will be the first to hit a billion dollars this year? Thank you. Enjoy the show. Well, thank you. Great question. Great question. Um, We've had this conversation quite often about it. And there's one particular viewer that doesn't like when we talk about the fact that we, is a movie going to hit a billion dollars? Why do you guys always bring that up? Because it's part of the business. It's what we do in the show. Skip that part. Um, but it is also, I think, a detriment to a lot of the studios because they're aiming for that, the billion dollar movie thing, right? And we, what we're not at is we're not in 2018, 20, what is it, 2017, 2018, when movies like that were, were hitting um, left and right, and people were going to the movies all the time because you didn't have streaming competing with it. Also, I mean, you still had Netflix, but there was it, it wasn't like it was now, where there's you're paying for all these different streaming platforms and all this different content that you could watch, and then you're also going to spend all this money to go to the movies. It's harder to do. We discuss it like, and I think that we brought it up on we brought it up on Capes and Cows yesterday. 2025 has a lot of big movies coming out, and. It's finally, like 2023 was the first year where it started to really look like, okay, we have a release schedule now of what we normally do. And then they had to move some of the stuff out of 2023 because it got pushed into 2024 because of the strike. And then a lot of stuff from 2024 got pushed into 2025. So 2025 will really be the first year since the pandemic to have a full slate, like a big booming slate and you're going to have more opportunities there and it's a question of really your question of what does the box office and theaters look like now with all of these particular movies that people want to go see will there be a lot more of these potential even not necessarily a billion but big movies that could get close to it and make a profit to me that's the most important thing it's about making the profit if you hit the billion you hit the billion but billion doesn't mean overall theater success Profit's profit, and making money and getting people into the theater, that's the most important thing. But I understand completely that it was like this, you know, it's the billion-dollar dart, as we say. And the movies that I think could hit it, it's funny because I said, I because I was looking at it on, on a, and I was probably in the thinking in the past, and I was also not thinking about the release date on it. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if Kung Fu Panda did it, but clearly not. I don't think that movie's going to, I think it'll, be, it'll make money. But I think it'll make like four hundred or five hundred or whatever it made. Um, Despicable Me has a chance because of when it releases and because it's a summer movie. Um, Deadpool to me is the one that I think has the best shot right now. Deadpool, if it's good, especially if it's good, that's the one I think. I would say Deadpool, Despicable Me, maybe Inside Out too, but I doubt it. Those are the ones that I think have a shot. Um, and I could be wrong. It might be something. And Joker now, maybe Joker, maybe Joker. The first one made a billion. I thought the second one wouldn't hit a billion. I still am not confident in it, but I wouldn't be surprised. So I think that 2025 is going to be the year to really put the microscope on it and see to come back to that question. But that's what I think. Michael Meza, 6813, with the move to New York, will you 
Michael Meza, 6813, with the move to New York, what will you miss about living in Southern California? And what will you miss the least? I'm guessing the traffic. The traffic does stink. Um, the Honestly, the expenses. The expenses. It's really, really expensive to live here. Like, like criminally expensive to live here. I just told you how much, like, gas is. And, like, and there's... And they need to do something about, like, these poor people who are living on the streets. There's a really bad homeless problem here, and they need to help these people. Um, they need to figure out a way what – because there's, it's like there's a lot of mentally – like, there like there was a woman in my neighborhood. Um, there was a woman walking, an nor- nor- older woman walking, and a, a mentally an un- unstable guy on a bike walked by and slapped her in the head. And then went to the gas station and started screaming at the gas station pump. And it's like if you feel and, – and this is one of the things about, you know, and, and, and it's – I don't let my kids ride the bike in the neighborhood. And it's like that's – it's tough. Like that's one of the things. And there's – and well, it's, there's no difference in uh, New York. I'm not moving to Manhattan. I keep telling you this when you're about to write that. Stop it. I'm not moving to the city. I know that the city has a big problem there too. Um, and I think these people need help, not, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it seems, especially in LA, it seems very neglectful in the way that they're doing it. But, um, the, what will I miss? The weather is very nice here and the seasons is one of the reasons we are moving back because my kids have never felt the seasons and, and all that. And. And I actually enjoy cold more than I enjoy the heat, strangely enough, and so does my wife. Um, but the, it's re- the f- restaurants here are wonderful. Really like the restaurants here. And my friends. I mean, I got a lot of friends here. A lot of friends here. So um, that's the stuff I'll miss the most. Nerds and rage. Do you think Feige will stay on with Marvel during what likely will be the next 10 years of the Fantastic Four and X-Men? Tough question. Tough question. I think he'll definitely be there for the launch of Fantastic Four and X-Men. But the question is, does he want to stay there for that long? Does he? I mean, it's like you always feel like these people want to say, okay, look, I did this for, for a while, and now I want to try something else. I want to try to go to another company and do this. It's like when general managers of sports teams are like, I want a championship here. I want to win a title over there. I think what he is definitely trying to do now is because let's use the sports analogy. He's won a ton of championships, but the team right now is not it's not in the basement, but it's not in it's 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 they're not in the playoffs yet. He's got to get them back to the playoffs and he's got to get them to win championships first. And once he does that and they win another championship, then then he's going to be like, "Okay, you know what? I don't want to go through that to where it's like, here's the down thing again. I'm just I'm going to get out of here and now I'm going to go build up somebody else." Um so I don't know if 10 years he's going to stick around for the whole thing. I know that he does love both X-Men and Fantastic Four. So it's possible. But 10 years? I mean, 10 years is a while. And that means he'll be there for, you know, God knows how long at that point. So it's possible. But I say not likely that he'll be there for the whole run. But I wouldn't be surprised. Speaking of nerds and Gage, he comes back with, how important is it for DC as a brand to get Superman right what happens with Gunn and Saffron if it does fail? PSA for people complaining, he's a Boy Scout and naive, he is. But you use that fact as a story point. But also remember, he's the only one that could crush you with his hangnail. Keep up the great work. Great point. I, look, Superman to me is my favorite, always been my favorite. Very excited to see it. I like Man of Steel, and I like the swing. This was the, okay, I should have used this yesterday. Shoot, should have used this yesterday when we were talking about Transformers 1, where people say, like, I like a different bit of the change when it comes to the tone of Transformers, right? Yes, but as long as it doesn't lose the essence of what it is in general, because that that version of Prime, even before he's Prime, to me, doesn't seem anything like the character at all, even trying to transform into the character. But in Superman, in Man of Steel, it was a dark tone, but it still felt like Superman was just a different version of Superman. So, And I know there's a lot of people who don't like Man of Steel. I did like that movie. Um, But it is... I haven't seen a version of, like what you known to love about Superman, that kind of Boy Scoutish, if you will, just pure of heart, good, um, not not the dark tone. In since the Superman 
Christopher Reeve once. Brandon Routh was he was fine, but the movie itself not good. Um, there are moments, but overall not great. I'm looking for a really good one, and I'm looking for one to set up Superman to be a staple of the DC universe. But I think to answer your question, and I've said this many times, this is crucial for Warner Brothers and DC, and James Gunn knows it. If Superman fails, fails. Like if it makes money, if it doesn't hit a billion dollars, people will always say, oh, it didn't make a billion dollars. Who cares? People said, oh, Man of Steel, it made like $700 million. It made a lot of money, whatever it made. It made a lot of money. Um, but, and that was also because of the time it was in, that people thought it was going to be, you know, it was going to be supposed to do much better than it did. But my point is, if it does poorly or breaks even, that's the end of this DC universe. You can't go forward with it. Because if you can't hit with Superman, you cross your fingers and hope Batman runs, and then you run with another, you know, Batman's your lead for the whole thing with Superman kind of popping in and out. This one needs to hit. It needs to hit, and it needs to hit big. It needs to make money. It needs to get people excited about Superman again. It has to be the staple of the DC universe. It's the one you're launching with. It's got to be, like, oh, that's what he's going to do. I can't wait to see it. That's what Iron Man did. He went, whoa, Iron Man was awesome. They're going to do more of these? That's cool. That's great. What what What's this MCU thing all about? It's going to carry on with, with Tony Stark trying to put, wait, what's that scene with the Avengers? Oh, this could be interesting. And that's what they need to do with Superman. Oh, it's Superman. That's Oh, that was a great Superman movie. I haven't seen him. That reminded me of the Donner movies. That reminded me of what I loved about Superman. Oh, I can't wait to see what he does now when they set this up. Oh, wait, what was that at the end? That was Supergirl? And they played that. Oh, wait, I can't wait to see that Supergirl. That, that movie's coming out now. That's the kind of excitement you got to get for it. So if they do that, off to the races. If you leave and go, eh, they're in trouble. And Gunn's not a, a dummy. He knows that. Andrew Burnett, 152. What's your favorite Steve Gutenberg movie? I love this question. Um, I mean, I got to. I mean, I really like Short Circuit. I haven't seen it in so long. It's the one that kind of stands out to me. Um, I don't remember Cocoon that much. But the Police Academy, for sure, they're probably the first one. Police Academy. So those are the ones that come to mind. But my favorite Steve Gutenberg is his Instagram feed. You talk about a positive influence on people. Just go by his Instagram feed. Throw in a comment that I sent you because you will smile. You will smile. He doesn't know who the hell I am, but you will smile. Um, he is just a beacon of positivity, and he's just got such a great energy about him and just has great insight on life. And he's just, if you're in a bad mood, go to Steve Gutenberg's Instagram page. It's wonderful. I love Steve Gutenberg. Always have, but his Instagram feed is just amazing stuff. And this is the type of stuff that, like, he said, someone just walked up to him one day on the street and said, oh, man, I love your stuff you post on Instagram. He said, that guy made my day. Steve Gutenberg rules. So, yeah, go by Steve Gutenberg's Instagram page. Say hello to him. Sure. And tell him that I sent you. Ruben Quiros 4859 What do you think Quentin Tarantino's final movie should be? Kill Bill, Volume 3. I saw some people running around saying that um, Zendaya should be... Um, should be the daughter of Vivica A. Fox. And that would be great. And then you could have the daughter, uh, actually Uma Thurman's actual daughter, who Stranger Things. And and she, what was she in recently? I just saw her in. Well, I know she's Inside Out too, But I mean, she's in tons of stuff now. But she's really great. Have her play the daughter of um, of Bill and, um, and the bride. And then you probably would have to start with Uma Thurman's character either getting killed off or losing that battle because she, they have that great scene in the beginning of Kill Bill Volume 1 and saying that she, you're going to come looking for me. And and he always said that he was going to do that. I think you got to end. If you're going to... First of all, I don't think this is his last movie. I've been saying that for a long time. The guy has it in his blood to make films. I don't know why he made this decision that he's making his last film, the 10th film, his last one. Bummer about the movie critic. That cast was looking incredible. And the fact that Tom Cruise, uh, uh, Brad Pitt, all these other people that would, and the people from the past movies were going to come in. And he just looked at it and said, this isn't it. Respect. But that also makes me believe this is what I think is going to happen. I think 
he does Kill Bill Volume 3. Then, five years later, or whatever it is, he goes, you know what, I finally perfected this movie critic script. I'm going to do it now. And he does it. He's not going to retire. No chance. There's no way. There's no way. Quentin Tarantino will be will, will die with a camera in his hand. There's no way he retires. I I just don't I just don't buy it. The the guy is just if you if you cut his arm, film would fall out. He he's just there's there's no chance. I, I don't want I it's easy to say this is my last film before you've shot the last film. And then when it's actually your last film, it's why like wrestlers and boxers and all these people, they always come back for more fights because it's in their blood and they can't, they don't know, they have to do it because that's all they know. I mean, what's he's going to produce? Okay, sure. There's no chance Quentin Tarantino retires after his 10th film. Unless, you know, and God forbid he's he's ill or something, um, then maybe. But if he's still moving and kooky, man, kooky. If he's still kooky, He's going to be making films. Um, I don't think it's his last. But what do I think his last one should be? If it is his last, Kill Bill Volume 3. I love 1 and 2. Flotilla, 4852. Spielberg doing a UFO movie. It will be a fantastic topic of interest. It sure will be. Because I think Steven Spielberg is way more involved in the UAP community than he leads on to, or at least he is public about. And I think he knows more than we do. And he, for those of you who follow this topic or don't, uh, if you don't know, if you don't know the name Alan Hynek, um, he was a major, major member of the UFO community. He was a consultant on Close Encounters of the Third Kind, as well as Jacques Vallée and, and, and a lot of other people. Um, Steven Spielberg knows about this topic, knows a lot about this topic. I would be very interested to see what a... 2000 and I guess 25, 26 UFO Steven Spielberg movie looks like, especially with all the stuff going on now and how much he's actually paying attention to it. And what does that look like? Is it a UFO movie more in the fantasy kind of world of like ET or is it more close encounters y or is it more, you know, like playing into the David Grush um, public hearings type thing with more happening or is there more like a War of the Worlds type thing? So it's always great to have him put his hat in that ring because that's, uh, that's, just, that's one of his strong points. So I'm excited to see that. I think it's a great choice. Tom Davini, 7280. Will there be a Schmoes reunion episode before the move to New York? Probably not. Um, we are going to do, I think I just talked to Ellis yesterday, and we're going to do a comedy show at the Comedy Store and I think the tentative date is May 30th. Um, and it'll be like a, a going away show that we're going to do. And there'll probably be some some of the old peeps there and catch up with. But in it's, in studios is, is really hard to do, getting everybody together. I tried to put together that – I'm going to try to put together that JTE, Kate Mulligan, Roxy, Finstock show because it's supposed to do that. It was, it was something that – was came through a live stream show that I've been trying to put together forever and I cannot get people's schedules together. I've tried if if I if I say I've tried to put that show together 20 times, I would be undervaluing how many times I actually tried to put it together. So I'm gonna try that one again. Um Ellis will definitely come in. Ellis wants to do like a movie review or a couple other things together. So Ellis will probably do more stuff for sure. Uh, everybody else is all over the place. Makuga doesn't even live here anymore. Riley's in the middle of uh, of Babyville. So um, Ken, I had l breakfast not too long ago. So, you know, I, I wouldn't mind having Kenny on, see if I can try to get him on. But having everybody together, it's going to be tough. It's just, it's a, it's like, a, it's just a different time now. You know what I mean? But, um, but having a couple people pop in here and there would be, would be fun. All right, we're doing two more here. Michael5930, what are your thoughts on the new upcoming Avatar The Last Airbender movie, which focuses on the original cast as adults? Hopeful, skeptical, much love from East Coast Canada. Thank you so much, and much love to you as well. Listen, this is the problem with me and this question. I don't know enough about it to be invested in it one way or another or to be mad about it, right? Steph's a good person to ask because she really this is this is her cup of tea. I didn't watch the series, so I don't know. I know that there were some people who were back and forth on that Netflix series. Um, the only answer I guess I can give you, which is a typical kind of I guess cliche answer at this time, is that 
if it's a good story, I'm in. If uh, it's, I'm not going to be one of those people for this that when I watch and go, well, wait a minute, they didn't do that for this particular thing. Uh, I don't know if I can get invested in it because I'm not invested in enough into the lore that that's going to affect me. So if it's a good story and it's good performances, it's good directing, you got me. All right, final one of the day. Thank you guys for putting these in there today. It was a lot of fun. Austin H7539. Hey, Christian, what are the odds that Patty Jenkins drops Lucasfilm again? Also, do you think it might be a good idea for Lucasfilm to make more original stuff like Lucas was doing when he made Star Wars, Indian Red Tails? It seems they get creatively bankrupt when they try to stick to franchises. Yeah, it is. It, they haven't tried to do anything outside of Star Wars and, and Indy, right? They've only going off of the actual IP that they have. And I think you would, if you can come up with something else um, inside of your brand, you you give yourself more possibilities, right? So I, I, and I think, why not have an original team that's like, hey, we're going to do a Lucasfilm original of this. I think they absolutely, at least put it on Disney Plus, try something like a Disney Plus movie. I also don't understand why they don't do stuff there with um, with Star Wars and do the Disney Plus original movies as well as the other ones. But as far as the Patty Jenkins side of it, um, very possible. I just don't understand why that announcement was even made again. Not not because I don't want to see Patty Jenkins do a Star Wars movie. I do. Uh, I like Patty Jenkins a lot. I think that it's just you're opening yourself up for another one of these particular disappointments. And that's because we don't understand yet. And maybe they don't even know the answer to this. But what we do know is that May of 2026 is The Mandalorian and Grogu. We know that that's when that movie's coming out, in May of 2026. And then I think we know that in December, that's when the Ray movie happens. At least that's what I think has been announced thus far. You can correct me in the comments. Now we turn to 2027 and we say, okay, well, are they going to put something out in May again? And if so, is it going to be the Filoni movie? Is that what hits in, in – that'll give you enough time to build up Ahsoka Season 2 and all this other stuff and close out the series of Mandalorian and all that, and then it all comes to a head in May of 2027. So then does the Mangold movie go in December of 2027, or does Patty Jenkins go in December of 2027? And where's Taika Waititi in all of this? But let's say that it's James James Mangle. Well, that means that Patty Jenkins is now 2028. This four years away. Or let's reverse it. Let's reverse it. Let's say that Patty Jenkins does get that spot and it's three years away. And James Mangold is now 2028. Why the hell are you announcing a James Mangold movie a year and a half ago or whenever it was? So that's that's the type of stuff that they keep doing that I don't get. But, and I am, and I and I will tell you my frustration here as I mentioned in the beginning of it too. I have mentioned many times over how I look at this like a sports thing. And I am not one of these channels that every single thing that Star Wars puts out, I'm gonna go like this and say, Star Wars is dead. Star Wars can easily make a comeback if they put things um, out there that works. And as I just said, good writing, good acting, all that. But I won't just Glory, uh, praise something to praise it. So when someone says, all you do now is complain about Star Wars, and it's like, I don't like what I'm seeing right now. I'm not telling you. This is the difference. If I told you, and if you like it, well, then you're part of the problem. If you like it, that's fantastic. That's great. That's great. If you dig it, then you dig it. And you, find, you have found something inside of these shows that you respond to and that you enjoy and that you like, and you might like the writing, and you can disagree with me when I say I think that there's some bad writing in it. You like the writing, and it makes you feel good, and that's great. But how dare you say to me, all you do is complain about now, so it's hard to listen to you talk about it. Then listen, go to the, the next time code and watch a different things. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you, and I'm telling you right now, when it comes to the Patty Jenkins thing, if you think it's a good choice to announce movies five years before they even come out with a director, when you have a history of losing directors and writers and actors like that, I think it's bad marketing. I think it's a continual taint on a IP that doesn't need more taint. Um, 
But the difference is also, I'm always rooting for it. And I want it to make a comeback. I want it to, I'm, I am crossing my fingers that Acolyte is going to, what I want to tell you guys is that, hey, I was wrong about that 30 minute episode thing. Really was. Like 30 minutes, she did it with Russian Doll. And she made shorter episodes work, and she developed her characters. I know everything about these characters. I am locked into this show. This is the best show that they've done since Andor. That's what I. That's what I want to say. And and who gives a shit if I did say that when I do watch it? There's gonna be people out there. Well, look what this shill says. Of course he loves it. And people who don't know if it, today, yesterday I'm a hater, tomorrow I'm a shill. It's part of the business. It's part. It's what comes with it. But what I want to say is that I loved it. Now, I'm also prepared for the opposite. When I say, why is this 30 minutes long? It's, it, it is not sticking with the characters. I don't know who any of them are, and I don't care about any of these characters, and this is a disappointment. You hate on everything now. You might as well be a hate channel. It comes with the business. I get it. But I've got to be true to my overall feeling of how I'm feeling about it when I see it. And I don't know how it is. I'm hoping, of course I'm hoping for the first. I'd much rather someone tell me, like, you're a shell. Then, and love it. I would rather. I want. This is a time period that I haven't seen ever in live action. I'm rooting for it. I'm skeptical, but I'm rooting for it. Patty Jenkins. I. I. And again, because it just been. It's. It's the same thing. Fool me once. You know. Shame on. Uh, shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. So there you go. That's it. That's the show. What'd you guys think? Anything else that you want to ask? Throw that in there. Um, I guess you know what what you can do. What I and I haven't done this, and and people have told me to do this. If you want, because we do the super chats for um, for the Roka show on Monday. If there are super chats in this in this, because you can do it like afterwards. You can put super chats in in the actual comment section. If you put them here, I'll read them out on on the Roka show on Monday. Um, when we start the the question segment of the show. If not, then just join us on Monday. So thanks for joining us here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to you guys, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere podcasts are found. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that button. Thanks for joining us here today, and we'll see you on Monday. Bye, everybody.